scientist, researcher, world-renowned ufologist, and so much more. I wanted to quickly bring in this, the fact that the Cousins Brothers are filming this feature-length film, Area 52, based on uh, a lot of the stories they've heard from the hundreds of interviews they've done over the years. Uh, people, and I wanted to ask you real quick, because you mentioned the warring factions, do you know anything about the Draconians, or are they one of the rival factions that are trying to compete to take over this planet? Well, first, I'm going to say that I don't have hard evidence that there is out-and-out -out aggressive conflict now between those competing geopolitical territorial conflicts. What happened 270 million years ago, let alone 35,000 years ago, we humans don't know. And it's very clear that the non-humans, as well as human governments, do not want the current, I'm going to say, homo sapien sapien, meaning us, humans, to know that there is some sort of blackout on this civilization of humans knowing the truth that we're not alone in the universe, we never have been, that there are all kinds of intelligent civilizations, that this planet has served in some sort of a base category at least for uh, three of them, according to government whistleblowers, and that those three compete politically. Now, competing politically, having geopolitical territory, does not mean that you are actively at war. We think of war with guns and knives and bullets and, and now lasers and beams and drones. So if you take a sentence that was given to me by the retired defense intelligence agent, that we're talking about extremely advanced intelligences that when they compete with each other, they are competing in two basic categories. One, manipulation of minds. Two, using time, being able to manipulate time in order to affect changes that would serve those civilizations in competitive ways. And there you get to the question, how would you use the manipulation of time if you were in political conflict or competing? Well, maybe part of the issue here, it's been suggested by people like Dan Barish and many people in the human abduction syndrome, that if we knew the truth about what has happened on this planet, the evolution of standing up primates from Homo erectus up to the current now in 2014, that in these two million years that there have been different extraterrestrial intelligences that have mixed and matched genes for reasons actually unknown, but that the product of that mixing and matching of genes has been the varieties of standing up primates, of which we are the latest model. And a question that is often asked, and no one has an answer for this either, if Neanderthal, the previous standing up primate, was gentle, as they are now thinking, had spiritual relationship to things like the, their dying and had grave ceremonies and put flowers on them, and that recently, only in the last year, there has been, have been reports that the Neanderthals are the ones that are now considered by archaeologists and anthropologists to have painted the beautiful, exquisite, accurate animals in the caves on the French-Spanish border. Up until just now, it was always assumed that Cro-Magnon Homo sapien sapien must have been the artist of these exquisite paintings. If, in fact, it's Neanderthal, the standing up primate before this one, they were advanced, they were intelligent, they were artists. Why, if extraterrestrials are responsible for terraforming Earth, for manipulating DNA, creating a variety of standing up primates, perhaps to do work for them, 
without the uh, primates understanding what, what their purpose was, and that humans in the last 35,000 years have played some role for these competing extraterrestrials, the big question is, why are we humans so violent? And interestingly enough, also just in the year 2014, a very interesting answer came to me through work I was doing on the hybrid question and the very interesting book, Rachel's Eyes, that came out in 2005 by Helen Luttrell and Jean Bilodeau. And in that book, it is Helen Luttrell, the mother of a blind college student in Sacramento, who met a man who introduced himself as an Air Force colonel, calling he's called, uh, let's see, in the book, I have to be careful about real names, in the book he is called Colonel Nadine, with an N, and that he brings a very thin, uh, parsley haired, uh, always wearing dark sunglasses, always wearing coats over clothes and boots, to the apartment where Helen gets to meet this girl that the colonel introduces as his quote unquote daughter. And because her daughter cannot see very well, Helen was the only witness to a very interesting moment in this apartment of her daughter's where the colonel <coughs> has arranged with the college for his quote-unquote daughter to be a roommate with the blind Marissa and the thin roommate is called Rachel. And the mother, Helen Luttrell, is there one day had, ne had not yet met Rachel, had heard her daughter talk about how nice she was, but very strange and very quiet. And Helen is there, and Rachel comes out wearing all these clothes and her uh, sunglasses on a hot summer day. And Rachel is introduced to Helen with Marissa there. And she said Rachel tripped on a rug on the floor, and that Helen, the mother, seeing that Rachel was going to fall straight forward, was not putting her arms out as humans normally would, and had her arms full of papers and books. Helen reached out to grab one of uh, Rachel's arms to hold her up and felt not a human bone, not a human arm. She didn't know what she had grabbed but that unlike our, if you take a hold of your wrist right now and feel with your own hand how your own wrist feels, it's bumpy with bones and it is thin skin on bones at anybody's wrist that is human. Instead, Helen Luttrell was feeling sponginess. It gave, but there were no bones and she didn't know what she had grabbed onto. And when eventually, uh, and the glasses, the glasses fell down on Rachel's nose, and Helen was looking right into solid, no uh, dark round pupil as in human eyes. These were solid green eyes shaped, almond shaped, and slanted up around the side of, of uh, Rachel's face. And Helen compared it to, if you cut open an avocado, that the color of an avocado around the pit, it's sort of a pale green. That was the entire color of both eyes. But where the human round black pupil would be, there was a pupil, and it was black, but it was vertical. And Helen said she immediately thought of a cat's eye and I said, could it have been a reptilian eye? And Helen said, I guess, but I don't like reptilians and snakes, so I have always thought of Rachel having cat eyes. Well, throughout the human abduction literature for the last 30 to 40 years, there have been people in the human abduction syndrome who have been taken in missing time, and they have drawn 
some of the non-humans they have interacted with. And in many cases, whether they are tall blondes, tall red hairs, short grays, medium-sized grays, or reptilian humanoids with scales, many are drawn with vertical pupil eyes that can be compared to a snake or cat. And at my news website, earthfiles.com, when I did these series of reports of my interview with Helen Luttrell and Jean Billadu and about Rachel, the hybrid, I showed a series of eyes of a cat, a series of eyes of snakes, and the drawing that Helen made from her encounter and seeing what was behind Rachel's eyes. And it's very interesting to look and compare the Rachel hybrid eye and the cat eyes and the snake eyes. I recommend everybody to go to earthfiles.com. And it was uh, about a month ago, so it would have been in the early, uh, late May, that I did the uh, Coast and Earth Files in Dreamland about this hybrid. And all of this comes down to this question. If hybrids, as the colonel ended up talking to uh, Helen Luttrell and her daughter Marissa, as being part of a humanization program, that's how the colonel ex explained his work, and that since the late 1950s, he had been working on the northern end of Area 51, Nevada, near Groom Lake and the Nellis Air Force Base Range, but the famous Area 51 on the north side, underground. He stressed this is all underground. That from the 50s on, that he and others had been working in a human hybridization program in order to have a collaboration with the Eben type of extraterrestrials where they could have territory underground that the government granted it in an exchange, a sort of treaty, that we would get extraterrestrial technology. They would be allowed to work un, uh, un, not interfered with underground to genetically mix and match to make clones and hybrids. Now, if, if that has been going on since the late 1950s and non-humans had been working and mixing and matching genes on this planet for 270 million years, you can see that the huge question is, what is the need of the Eben type of non-humans to have territory on Earth in the 20th to the 21st centuries to make <coughs> hybrids? And that question, believe it or not, is still not clear. Now, these hybrids are obviously are being made for a reason. And uh, a lot of people say, such as Timothy Good, uh, John Lear, that they are actually walking amongst us. And clearly this case of Rachel uh, is an example of this. Do you know how many of them there are? Do you know why they're possibly trying to, to walk amongst us unnoticed? I asked Helen Luttrell and Jean Billadu that exact question, and they both said that in all of their efforts to track down Colonel Nadine, uh, what you have to take a timeline here. Uh, we're back in uh, the 1970 period for the college uh, roommate, and then uh, Hel uh, Helen said. They weren't uh, roommates very long when soon after the tripping on the rug and the sunglasses coming down the nose, Rachel disappeared from the apartment, leaving a note for Marissa, the blind daughter, saying she appreciated be knowing her and being able to live there, but that it was uh, time for her to move on and that she knew that, uh, that Marissa and Helen Luttrell had been told that she was a hybrid and that she wanted to give Marissa a gift. And the gift was literal sight. For a while, 
Marissa could read the note and was astonished when she realized that she was reading the note that Rachel had left and how this gift of sight for a while was granted, no one understood. But Colonel Nadine, who Helen Luttrell tried to get in touch with, disappeared as well. And she worked at Mather uh, Air Force Base in Sacramento. Uh, and the colonel uh, was supposed to have come from, no, sorry, she was working at McDill Air Force Base, and the colonel was coming from Mather Air Force Base. And she was able to work with some people she worked with at her Air Force Base and that they found that all of the original paperwork on Colonel Nadine that uh, was there before and when he brought Rachel to be in the apartment, he had introduced himself, his paperwork was in order, all of it seemed normal in the sense that he was a military person working for the Air Force and uh, that could be confirmed. But as soon as Rachel left the apartment, and left Marissa the gift of sight. When Helen Luttrell tried to follow up with Colonel Nadine, his, he had disappeared and all his paperwork had disappeared. It's a true mystery. And this is in a long answer to your good question and my question to them. The only source of all the information about the hybrids, Colonel Nadine, disappeared. And no one has ever, ever been able to find him, and no one ever heard anything more about Rachel. But at earthfiles.com, in my reports about Helen Luttrell, Rachel the hybrid, Colonel Nadine, Marissa the blind roommate, I have a letter that came from the American River College in Sacramento that was sent to Helen Luttrell and Jean Bilodeau when they were trying to confirm if a Rachel with, <clears throat> with the actual real name they have for Rachel was a student and they confirmed Rachel with her real name was an enrolled student at the American River College in Sacramento at exactly the time that she was a roommate with Marissa. So humanization program today in the 21st century? Is it ongoing? I asked Helen that. She said, I assume that it is. She said, I assume that it's been going on underground for a long time and are hybrids being taken to another planet somewhere uh, as exchange students from the Earth? That was one of the hypotheses. Are there a lot of hybrids on the surface of this planet trying to learn how to live here? That is another hypothesis and an unanswered question. And isn't it fascinating that we are all being exposed to the concepts of hybrids and clones interacting on this planet underground and above ground, but that we are that far in our language and in our interviews through people who have been in the human abduction syndrome, who have met alleged hybrids like Helen Luttrell, and that you and I are talking on a, a national and international uh, broadcast in, in the net and so forth about subjects that the government of the United States, England, Australia, Canada, the uh, colleagues of World War II have policies of denial about, as of this date, 60 years after there were obviously discussions about this between President Eisenhower and Churchill and Truman and FDR. You know, you mentioned this happening in Sacramento, which is not far from Palo Alto. And there exists the Carrot Facility, which is something you talked about, which actually links back to something that you mentioned earlier with regards to what's in Turkey with Gobekli Tepe. Uh, yeah, that's right. Can you talk about the Carrot Facility and what its significance is and how it relates to the ancient archaeology? Let's see. How shall we do this and make it have some sort of a 
comprehensible timeline. Let's start just a little bit about Gobekli Tepe, and then I'll go to the carrot uh, document and that revelation. Uh, for the very first time, it's hard to believe, <coughs> but 2010, only four years ago, was the very first press release, information, anything about this incredible archaeological discovery in southern Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. In Turkish, Gobekli Tepe means pot-bellied hill. And the reason it got that name, it, has, it rises 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet above a valley. And it is very close to the Syrian border, if you put that in your mind. And it is in an area that has been fed by water by the Euph famous Euphrates River for thousands of years, literally. And it was in the 1960s that there were uh, uh, some archaeology researchers from both Turkey and from the United States who were in that area, they were doing archaeology, they were not digging in the ground. But the archaeologists thought enough about the shape of this strange pot-bellied hill to write up in a report that they were doing on other Turkish archaeology that this hill had what they considered to be an uh, uh, artificial shape and that it deserved to be dug into. And that finally started happening in 1994 by a German archaeologist named Klaus Schmidt. Klaus Schmidt worked uh, very meticulously and was doing carbon dating as he went, and none of us knew that what he was finding in the bits of carbon as they dug through the top of this hill, carbon dating that the pillars of limestone uh, 19 to 20 feet tall, weighing tons, it placed in circles on this hill underground, were 12,000 years old. In 2010, a lot of scientists were first staggered by this report from the German archaeologists because up until 2010, it was still accepted that the so-called sophisticated archaeology of Mesopotamia and Egypt was the beginning. This suddenly more than doubles the age of intelligent, exquisite in, in limestone. And with that doubling of the age, one of the things that I was there two years ago and that I was personally stunned by is how similar the carvings of some of the birds on some of the tall limestone pillars are to what you all have seen in Egypt, the winged bird holding a disc. In Egypt, it's been called a shen, S-H-E-N. And that shen symbol of the bird with the disc related to that circle around the names of the kings and queens of Egypt, where their names went into what we call a cartouche. The cartouche is actually the shen. It is the encircling of a name to give that person eternal life. If the shen at the circle of the disc does not surround the name they will not be guaranteed eternal life. That was the Egyptian concept. Well, here, I'm two years ago standing in front of one of these pyramids, or I'm sorry, pillars at uh, Gobekli Tepe, and I'm looking at a bird holding a disc on one of these incredible pillars, wondering, oh my God, this must be the source of all of these concepts in Egypt. And if Gobekli Tepe might be the source of these concepts in Egypt and Mesopotamia, what is its true relationship on this planet to a maker? Because Klaus Schmidt has never found a tool 
no signs of habitation, meaning that this entire pot-bellied hill, Gobekli Tepe, covering 30 acres, of which there are more than 200 of these tall, beautiful, elegant, tall uh, limestone pillars placed in circles in these 30 acres, ring upon ring upon ring, and they're all underground. They only know that it continues for 30 acres because they did deep ground penetrating radar, and the deep ground penetrating radar showed that these pillars of limestone in circles extends for 30 acres, and that's when Klaus Schmidt, doing more research into the soil and the nature of this strange hill and this archaeology, came to the startling conclusion only about three years ago that the carbon dating is 12,000 years old, but soil compression tests show that the entire top of the hill covering the pillars that they've been uncovering was completely covered up a thousand years after all of those pillars were placed there 12,000 years ago. So what happened 11,000 years ago that could have provoked extraterrestrials or even Mesopotamian or Turkish civilizations to want to cover up all of these pillars and rings and circles on Gobekli Tepe. Well, this is work that I've done a great deal with <coughs> atmospheric physicists at uh, university work in Arizona, and their work says this, which may or may not relate to the monitoring of this planet <coughs> excuse me, by the dragonfly drones in the carrot technology. So hold those thoughts in your head. 12,000 years ago, the planet was coming out of the last ice age that reached its height at 18,000 years ago, meaning there was ice all over the northern climb <coughs> of North America and Europe. <coughs> But the Mediterranean remained dry throughout that ice age. Remember that. And so did the central and southern United States. Most of the ice was in the upper half of Canada to the Arctic and the upper part of northern Europe. That was solid ice. But these areas that we're talking about, Gobekli Tepe, Turkey, and Mesopotamia, were never covered with ice during the last ice age. And when everything began to warm up, 12,000 years ago, interestingly enough, is exactly the time that these 30 acres were covered by these big, tall, heavy limestone pillars, beautifully cut, etched, placed on this hill. Well, who could have done that? Who could have done that without tools, as we know? And who could have covered it all up very rapidly a thousand years later, and why? What happened a thousand years later, around 11,000 years ago, from these University of Arizona scientists, they are now studying what is called the Younger Dryas and a carbon mat that they have found all over North America. A carbon mat means huge thousands of square miles of land here burned. That's the carbon. It's a layer. And this Younger Dryas carbon mat is so extensive that they have now come to this hypothesis that is moving toward a theory, that there were incoming meteorites and or comets or combination thereof that slammed into North America and caused devastation in the skies, fires all over the planet, but that the impact was the North American side, and that would explain why the big mastodons were found with buttercups literally fast frozen in their mouths. Saber-toothed ti tigers, saber tigers have been found with their spines uh, spun around 180 degrees by some unimaginable force. 33 species of large animals in North America went extinct. 11,000 years ago in what has been considered one of the big mysteries of this planet, never to totally explained. Well, 
Now, if the hypothesis is now about Gobekli Tepe, that this was constructed by an advanced intelligence that was not Homo sapiens sapien, and it did so when the Earth was warming up, did it have advanced information from its own drones and craft and monitoring throughout the solar system that something was coming in and was going to cause devastation, and they did not want to lose this self-activating machine that was providing, let's assume, energy communication with other stone circles around the planet, and they had the ability with advanced technologies to cover up Gobekli Tepe. That is current discussion, even with a geologist such as Robert Schock from Boston University, who has done so much work on the Sphinx. And when we were there in Gobekli Tepe, he was leading us through the archaeology. And he said in a private conversation and then talked about it publicly that he himself looks at Gobekli Tepe as somebody's advanced technology on the earth uh, and that what these stone circles throughout the history of this planet might have been serving is for energy and communication that we still don't understand, but that the key of the symbol in the circle is the key to self-activating software for self-activating machines made by extraterrestrial biological entities, and there is the leap to the carrot document, the Dragonfly Drones, 2007, when a bunch started being seen and photographed in the sky in May and June of that year, and I was covering it almost weekly. Uh, web, uh, Lex at Coast to Coast AM website that I also do radio for, he was receiving information. The two of us were putting up leaked documents from a man who called himself Isaac with extraordinary photographs allegedly from the Palo Alto Carrot Laboratory in which it was described as being on the surface just like a plain old red brick building a couple of stories high but where the action was happening was underground and a very large defense department paid for laboratory large enough to accommodate 200 scientists working underground and that there those scientists were brought together by the Department of Defense to study and back engineer extraterrestrial technology and the document that Isaac leaked to me and to Lex, and then he put it on the web, was called the Carrot Document because those were capital, all capital letters, C-A-R-E-T, standing for Commercial Application, or I think it's Applications, plural, Research of Extraterrestrial Technology. Extraterrestrial is in the title of the document. Extraterrestrial is used throughout this document. And the document discusses three critical areas of extraterrestrial technology that the United States government, through all these different scientists, have been trying to back engineer. One, the ability to neutralize gravity. Two, invisibility by being able to control and deflect photons. And three, the ability to project three-dimensional holograms that human retina could not tell from the environment of the world around us. Invisibility, neutralizing gravity, and projecting camouflage 3D holograms. That sounds like intelligences that want to work on this planet, but they don't want humans to know it. The, uh, the dragonfly drone that would have been in the category of their monitoring, Isaac said in communication that he knew 
that those dragonfly drones had been in the skies of this planet for decades and his implication was for centuries. So why were they suddenly showing up in 2007? Because the United States government apparently has been working on trying to find the frequencies that extraterrestrials use to camouflage their self-activating machines and that the summer of 2007, whosoever they were in the sky, somebody was jamming frequencies and these dragonfly drones were being made to flicker in and out of visibility. So apparently, whosoever they were, they caught on. That we were all publicizing it, and whatever the frequency was had to have been changed because nobody has been reporting uh, these dragonfly drones flickering in and out of the skies much since 2007. So there is the sort of big picture synthesis millions of years, extraterrestrials doing all kinds of things in circles and rings on this planet because they understand something about symbols, patterns, circles, interacting with fields that create communication and energy that we don't understand, and that th these have been operational at least to the time of Gobekli Tepe 12,000 years ago, and through some Earth catastrophe that uh, the one in Gobekli Tepe was apparently covered to protect it for reasons unknown, and that the dragonfly drones show up in 2007. Isaac releases this incredible document showing that the extraterrestrial self-activating software is in circles and circles and circles with symbols throughout symbols, and that whatever the state of U.S. back engineering is today of extraterrestrial technology, this government still has not told anybody the truth. As they have not for decades, uh, uh, going back to at least uh, early 1940s from the Cape Girardeau incident, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. For, that was 41. And if not even earlier, right, possibly the Aurora 1896 crash, if that was even known at the time. But going back to the dragonfly drones, underneath there was some symbols. And if I'm not mistaken, one of your followers on your website, subscribers, was able to uh, possibly uh, translate these symbols into an equation, which linked up no, to... No, the, he was a truck driver. And I still remember the night. I was working at the computer producing an Earth Files report, and this email popped in, and he introduced himself as a truck driver. Uh, I think he was in Pennsylvania. And he said, I've been studying your website and looking at the uh, what we called the Chad photograph taken in May. And it, that was the person who got the very closest to the underneath the tail of the dragonfly. There's a ring with wires coming up from it and then this very long tail. That's what all of them have, a ring, yeah. wires coming up and a tail. And it's underneath the tail and sometimes on the side of the ring that these same type of symbols come. And this guy said, I turned and flipped the tail around and enlarged it. And Linda, this is what I think it says. And it was a series of letters like X, Y, space, uh, and a, a couple of numbers, and he said, I Googled this, and here's what I came up with. And it had taken him to a NASA site. And I'm looking at where he got, and I'm reading what the email is saying, and I thought, well, my God. So as a reality check, I copied the letters, and the, to my, the best of my ability, put them in the Google search bar, clicked on return, and here I am, not only at a NASA site, but when I went further from the NASA website, I am into Project Clementine. This was the Clementine mission in the uh, 19, uh, early, I think it was 93 or 94, where we sent Clementine to the moon to orbit, to take photographs of every square inch of the moon, the poles and the backside, 
and this is what I'm in, and I start clicking on more web links. This is what have been in uh, May of 2007, and I end up at websites where there were photographs that I could click on of the moon with uh, latitude, longitude, and I'm thinking, my God, I've gotten to these websites of photos on the moon by this truck driver sending me the uh, letters and numbers as he was interpreting them from the tail of the Chad Dragonfly photo, and here I am on the moon photos. Is there a connection between the Dragonfly drones as monitors of this Earth and perhaps monitoring bases on the moon all under the control of extraterrestrials? My own private hypothesis is that the answer to that question is yes. Now, it was, I posted all of this, did uh, Earth files on what I was finding, connected through the truck driver, the symbols on the bottom of the tail that it took us to the NASA Clementine mission. Within a week of my posting that, all of those links that would take you to the photographs were gone. And Somebody does not want the civilian population of this planet to be studying and analyzing the lunar photos from Clementine mission, especially not in relationship to the dragonfly drones. And as from your research that you've done over the years, it's not – it's not uncommon for them to erase things or make things disappear, yeah. uh, such That's as right. newspaper articles. That, like you were digging for Roswell and, and everything from Aztec. A Aztec. Az it was Aztec. It was the crash at Aztec, we think March of 48. And that I uh, interviewed the mother, the father, still alive, the son, now grown up. I interviewed them in Aztec at a conference there. I uh, talked with others who had all told me they had seen with their own eyes, even the eight-year-old boy, now a grown adult, remembered talking with his mom and dad over breakfast about the discs that had come down in Hart Canyon, H-A-R-T Canyon, in Aztec, and that military had gone in to remove it, and that they had seen this on the front page of the Farmington Times or one of the Aztec newspapers. I and, uh, 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 let's see, I, there was a whole bunch of people who, they even put up money in that area, asking or uh, arguing for uh, rewards that could be put out for anybody who could look in attics, basements, anywhere for that newspaper that so many people said that they remembered seeing in what they thought was 48. And to date... Everything was scrubbed as clean as a whistle. And there was one letter found, at, I think it was the Farmington Times, that it implicated that the editor had received information from somebody in Washington, D.C., or a request to get rid of the newspapers, but we never could prove exactly what that was about either. So here are eyewitnesses that were still alive decades later who remembered reading it, but the newspaper has been sanitized from all of the local archives. A again, going with missing things that are literally erased from history and altered, one book from the 60s, I think it was 67. I'm Greek, and, and this is why I took great interest in this book, Ancient Greek Gods and Lore Revisited. Right. That right. went missing and cannot be found anywhere you were able to find an author and yep. i went beyond that trying to find anything and there's nothing about that can you give us some background of how this yeah. relates to yeah uh, it, it, so we leave off that here is now this unbelievable uh link to link to link that i went through in may finding more and more about the moon and more and more people were encountering in June, see, uh, being out the, the most dramatic was in Big Basin, uh, Redwood Park in California, and these were bicyclers, were two different groups, and they took photographs, and I got the first batch, and then uh, a guy named Ty Brannigan sent me 12 
glossy photos in an envelope with a two-page typewritten letter fascinating about how he was out with a group and they were bicycling and this thing in the sky came and appeared. It would flicker in and flicker out, flicker in, flicker out. It happened four times and he was able to get 12 photographs of it in the third appearance. They saw it a fourth time, but it was very brief. It was like flickering in and out like something when Isaac said that uh, if you could jam the frequency, you might be able to see these things in the sky. But if they have a way to self-activate and change frequency, then they would flicker in and out. And uh, so we were getting uh, these great uh, photos. And I get an email from a man who says, I can't let you use my real name, I can't describe, I work I'm for a subcontract, subcontractor to Homeland Security, but this is what I've seen here. My job is to monitor banks of infrared cameras for security through Homeland Security and DOD, uh, and sent me a drawing and said this showed up at this Homeland Security place. And it also flickered in and out, but it was a, a dramatic encounter and left an impression that he drew it. And over the next year, so that would have been from 2007, uh, June, to do, into 2008, this particular individual had a series of dramatic encounters at work with people from in, intel agencies, who came to tell him to keep his mouth shut. His boss basically told him uh, the same thing. And then this guy went to a local uh, library because in his encounter with this object, he had gotten telepathic information that sounded Greek, a name O-L-T-I-S-S-I-S, -S -S, Oltesis, uh, as being responsible, the intelligence behind these dragonfly drones. It set him off on his own research path. And in the library, in his hands, in his car, for some period of time, uh, was this book, the title you just gave, uh, by a man named Ionides, uh, Frederico Ionides, and that he... The, we'll call it the Homeland Security guy, got to the book by because of what was downloaded into his head from a Dragonfly drone that showed up at his work, and that he uh, had the book in his car and was asking questions and had talked on the phone with somebody about the book, about Otesis, and that <clears throat> allegedly men from NSA and CIA and Homeland Security showed up at his work site <coughs> in, uh, uh, at this Homeland Security site. His boss had a meeting with him and these intel guys, and they knew he had the book, so he figured that they had been tapping his phone. They ordered him to go to the car, bring them the book, with his boss watching. He handed over the book asking them why would a book on Greek history be of national security interest and they wouldn't talk to him and took the book. And that's what set me off on trying to find this book. And to date, none of us ever have. And this uh, man who was operating and monitoring the infrared cameras for the Homeland Security site sadly died, perhaps of natural causes, his family thinks, about uh, three years ago. So there's been no, no other reality check and nothing further. And, uh, and so it is another one of those total huge unsolved mysteries. You know, why would the CIA erase a book about Greek mythology unless the Greek gods were actually extraterrestrials? What do you think about that? You hit the nail right on the head. I've been told that repeatedly over the last 20-some years. And uh, I know that Eric Von Donneken's latest book that was released in the fall 
uh, it was a re-release. It was a republication of a book he had done before, but it's very important. And that's what the title is and the book is about. The so-called Zeus and Titans were literally extraterrestrial biological entities based on this planet. And they warred with each other. And what did they war about? That is literally unknown. And I think this government doesn't want anybody to have any proof of anything about extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. It would explain Atlantis. It would explain Lemuria. It would explain things like Obekli Tepe. It would explain all of the strange machines that have been found and reported in that excellent book, Forbidden uh, Archaeology. We are on a planet that right now in the 21st century is living a concocted history. Because if you leave out advanced intelligences, extraterrestrials, time travelers, other dimensional travelers, you are leaving out the major part of the Earth's history. We're just the latest baby on the block, and whoever made us wants us not to know our true source. Why is that? I wish I knew. But the hybrids, the clones, the human abductions, the animal mutilations, the dragonfly drones, the discs, the cylinders, the spheres, the beams, all of it, all of it are all part of the same truth that other intelligences have been interacting with this planet for a very long time and we as a humanity at seven billion many many cultures on this planet have accepted and have other knowledge about extraterrestrials and have for centuries and we are for some reason that i don't fully understand why is it that a government policy of denial continues to hold the dam shut 60 years after World War II when increasing numbers of people around this planet are having their own firsthand experiences and they know that the policies of denials are lies? You know, we, we recently spoke to Mr. Von Donigan. And uh, obviously, he made a point that the ancient cultures clearly knew that they were getting their wisdom and technology and other things from their star people, as they as they put it to them. Why recently do you think uh, they're shutting us down and having this policy of denial? Are the ETs really calling the shots and, and suppressing this, telling our governments to suppress it? Or is it that our governments are suppressing it without the ETs help? I think they are both suppressing it, which sometimes has made me nervous. Why does secrecy also serve the extraterrestrials? Except now, with all this work I've done on Rachel and the hybrid issue, suddenly, for the first time, a really distinct possibility that provokes real compassion in me comes to the fore. That is... If the extraterrestrial biological entities that are very advanced intellectually, advanced technologically, have cloned and hybridized themselves into near collapse, maybe extinction, on the biological front, that they know that the only way to resurrect their life form civilization that has depended too much on cloning and hybrids is to go back in time, go back to healthy DNA that they've had something to do with and therefore they have a relationship to, and that perhaps the last century that was healthy enough to help them was the maybe the beginning of the 21st or the end of the 20th. And that Jim Penniston in RAF Bentwaters, when he says that he got that binary download and with it were the zeros and ones, but came the information that the black, glassy, wedge-shaped craft that came into uh, Rendlesham Forest next to John Burroughs, Jim Penniston, and Ed Kavansack 
on December 26, 1980, in a huge blast of light, was in fact a time machine from 50,000 years in the future. I mean, that truly sounds like sci-fi. We can't comprehend it, really. But that's the statement. And that 50,000 years in the future, there is the end. That something has happened. And that they are facing extinction if they can't do something to resurrect their DNA and their genetics. Well, let's say for a second that that's true, even though we can't prove it. Let's just say for a second, for the sake of this discussion, that that's true. Other people in the abduction syndrome, hundreds over the last 35 years, are going back as far as Betty and Barney Hill and coming up through time. I've talked with so many people who have said they've gotten the impression that the extraterrestrials need us in some way that they don't understand, or that the extraterrestrials are very sickly, or that they uh, can be here for only a short period of time and then they must go into another dimension or another timeline. Well, if that were true and that there is a relationship between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapiens, with something out there in the timeline 50,000 years in the future that is dying out because its biology is failing, <coughs> then you can look at this whole bloody situation and say maybe, maybe if we all knew the truth, the real truth, humans would feel sorry that Farmers and ranchers would say, oh, well, maybe if this is true and it was demonstrated to us what's really happening, that we would set aside animals, plants for harvesting in some sort of real public collaboration because the salvation of the time travelers, the other dimensionals, the extraterrestrial biological entities may be directly related to the future survival of Homo sapiens sapiens. And if we knew the truth and that all of us are interdependent and that we can't separate the advanced technologies of 50,000 years in the future to our own survival in 2014, maybe the whole planet would grow up and we would no longer kill each other so much and that we might have some sort of true treaty collaboration with other intelligences, not getting down on our knees to them, but as life forms in the universe that all need each other's help in order to survive. You know, you mentioned the self-activating software and these crop circles that have been appearing and are still appearing are getting more complex. Do you think that these crop circles are new software that's being put on this earth for maybe modifications to the drones or new missions for them? When I speak uh, in my lecture at Contact in the Desert in Joshua Tree in August, that lecture goes uh, <coughs> has a thread that goes through from <coughs> Gobekli Tepe through the mutilations, the abductions, the dragonfly drones, the carrot documents. And when you look at the, the self-activating software defined by Isaac, and you're looking at extraterrestrial diagrams that are related to the ability for this advanced technology to function in a field without having to have any organic intelligence there, it, it is all programmed and can do all sorts of complicated things. And you're looking at all of these diagrams, and the first thing that hit me were some of the crop formations that I had seen over the last decade since my first trip into a crop formation in 1992. And I thought, my God, they look so much alike. What if the reason for the crop formations for real, beginning in the 1970s, around Warminster and coming up through the decades, setting aside the stupid people going out there making them and trying to uh, laugh at people. Uh, they're real. There's a real phenomena, and it's always been a real genuine phenomena. 
what if extraterrestrials had been placing self-activating software on the surface of this planet in the skin of cereal crops and grasses, not only for the 20th to the 21st centuries, but for, perhaps for millennia, and that these crop formations end up having impacts on planets and timelines in ways that humans do not understand. You, you mentioned mutilations, and obviously there's been cattle mutilations, there's been horse mutilations, other animals, and, and one of the cases that you were researching, the I believe it was the farmer saw a silvery disc, and then when he was driving away, he saw a glowing beam. And oh, it's yes, I was there at that farm. Yes, in, in, it was uh, in the Kentucky, Arkansas area. And here is the, for a minute, here, let's get the timeline. This was uh, around 1974 to 77 time period, and there were mutilations of horses all over the Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, that region. And on this particular day, I was there at the house. I stood on the hill looking at this pasture. And the uh, farmer was explaining to me that they found a uh, one, I think his was one hour old. It was so, so fresh. It was a baby colt. And it was lying in this pasture. And around on the ground where they found this mutilated baby colt was a circle that ended up all of the pasture died and left this perfect circle. He said it was like ceramic. It was so hard that the, the he, I think he went down and put water on it, and it was ceramic hard. No water would go in it. There was no blood or fluid on or around the cold. But for that young colt to have been left with a very clean, bloodless excision in the middle of almost like physical evidence. This is who did this, right? It's almost like saying, this is who did this, uh, meaning not humans. It was, it was telegraphed. And they had more uh, horse mutilations. They were very upset. And it was one night after all of that that they're driving home, and his son is in the passenger seat. It's night. They had a gate that they had to get out and unlock. And standing right there at the gate, approximately three and a half to four feet high, was a gray with a head glowing uh, that had some glow about it. And uh, it scared them, but he remembered it well enough to draw it and said, I assume these are the ones doing the mutilations. Well. It sounds horrible, doesn't it? In the beginning of all my uh, animal mutilation investigations starting in September of 79, that's what I thought. Oh, my God, who would be doing this? I love animals. I don't like uh, violence. I don't want things to suffer. It's in my nature. And yet here I had to spend nine months making the television film A Strange Harvest. I had to be going into pastures and looking at all these mutilated animals. And as much as I was repulsed by the idea that they were dead, the thing that was intriguing and I think allowed me to keep going was the total, absolute desire to understand how you would take a 2,000-pound animal put them on their side or the back, take the same pattern of tissue and leave not a single track in dry, dusty powder dust around these big animals. And that's why law enforcement from the very beginning, going all the way back to the 1960s, they all were looking to the sky and said there's just no way that an animal can be found like we're finding these animals with no tracks around them unless something is lowering them to the sky after they've already been killed and mutilated. And it is that theme that the law enforcement knew. They knew the facts. 
so that by September of 79, a long, long time after mutilations of animals in every category, every domestic animal you can think of, deer, elk, marmots, wild rabbits, they've all been found the same way, bloodless excisions of tissue and sometimes organs from inside without any surgery on the torso, leaving the veterinarians to say this is impossible, there is no way to take a heart, a kidney, and so forth out without having an excision on the body, so how is this done? And it, you end up, as I did, sitting across from law enforcement and ranchers who are looking right at you and saying the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And that happened right from my very first interview with Sheriff uh, Tex Graves up in Logan County, uh, Colorado. He was the first one, showed me photos. We talked about all kinds of strange things that he had experienced in the 70s before he retired. And he, he looked right at me and said, Linda, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. I said, will you talk to me and say that on the record in front of our TV camera? He said, nope, you'll have to find somebody else. I ran into that so much, and it, it isn't just Lou Girota who was in the DA's office studying mutilations. Yeah, it, it isn't just uh, some of the scientists who talked to me in New Mexico. Lots of law enforcement knew without question that what they had seen in terms of beams and orange glowing spheres that could split in two and were in the pastures where they were going to investigate mutilated animals that it wasn't terrestrial technology, it never was, it is not. And for those who say, yeah, but what about the radar chaff stuffed in mouths? What about the uh, needles left with tranquilizers? It's called counterintelligence seeding of misinformation in evidence. That's what that is. They wanted to keep the public and the media as far away from mutilations as possible because they knew, as I know, in spades, it is the largest body of physical evidence on planet Earth of extraterrestrial interaction currently with this planet. And my attitude is, and I'd like to know if you guys feel the same way, this is a human family, no matter who made us, and it, this human family is now seven billion in number. Who designates a couple of hundred people in secret black dark agencies since World War II to say they are the only ones who can deal with this information? They are the only ones who can deal with extraterrestrials. They are the only ones that can handle the truth about our origins, the history of this planet, and the future of where we are going. Who says only 200 should have that right, while the rest of us are deliberately kept dumb and blind in the dark? Everything in me as a human being is, rejects that and says, we all, this entire planet, deserves all of the truth. And if we had all of the truth, then maybe there would not be so many wars and killing of humans. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, the fact that 200 people are calling the shots and preventing us from getting the information. Like you said, who gave them the authority to tell us what we can know right. Uh, th they can't speak for every human on earth, and I think that's just a shame. I know we're cutting close on time, and I want to get a couple more questions in before you go. Uh, we've been working closely with Stephen Bassett and keeping the citizen hearing alive and pushing, uh, hopefully, to get this uh, out there to the U.N. And when we had Senator Gravel on, we asked him what was the... What convinced him? And he said the witnesses. And you were one of the premier researchers at the event that provided them with the history and, and got them engaged. And we're going to be speaking to Congressman Cook in the right. next coming weeks. And he's also going to – we're going to be posing him the same questions. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that we're actually going to be able to force disclosure through them? Because what I worry about is the fact that these – artifacts, these alien artifacts are no longer in government possession whereas they've been
implanted into private corporations that don't have to answer to us. What do you think about that? It's a very good question. On the one hand, it was smart for the Truman and the Eisenhower administration to say we need to back engineer technology that we don't want anybody to know about because we're afraid that it will cause pa public panic, uh, religions will collapse, uh, stock markets will collapse, all of the standard uh, reasons that are given. So we will hand carry Lieutenant Philip J. Corso, described that in his own brilliant book, uh, the day after Roswell, and he was telling the truth. He was one of the hand carriers of extraterrestrial technology, knowing it was ET technology, to one individual or two in a corporation that would be sworn by non-disclosure and, and need to know and all of that uh, to back engineer extraterrestrial technology, get it uh, patented in the United States to keep it out of the hands of perceived human enemies in Russia, Germany, and so forth. That was a strategy. That is an intelligent strategy coming from a world war. But I think that what happened and why your question is a good one today, but I'm not certain that the answer is a positive one, and it is that the underbelly to all this, when you have corporations who have made billions, maybe trillions of dollars in profit over 60 years on items that they were hand-fed or handed to by the government that are having their salaries paid by taxpayer dollars when the strategy is the taxpayer dollars are never to know anything. And that's why the government works so hard to misinform and deny that there are any extraterrestrial machines and entities here, but what it means is that we have technologies from transistors to fiber optics and a lot, uh, semiconductors that Philip J. Corso tied directly to what we retrieved and back engineered. So now, if you end up in a government today where the money that feeds the political system, which is now they're locked at the hip with each other. What corporation wants to reveal that it has made all this money on extraterrestrial technology, that the government has had a policy of denial, and that people have been hurt and criticized and uh, have felt ridiculed by trying to report real extraterrestrial craft and entities that they have encountered. There's this gigantic Grand Canyon between what is really happening on the planet versus the concocted uh, mythology and history of that we're alone in the universe. So now, where once upon a time in World War II, it might have actually been easy to tell the world, well, we've just been through a war, and here are some of the things we've learned, and here's the truth. Today, you've got all of these vested corporate interests, in, along with the government, also keeping this completely and totally away announcement. And that's why I think it's now even more difficult than it ever was for this to become a political world truth. And then that leads to, will any of the non-humans just step up to the plate and cut through it all and do some sort of a in-your-face landing and announcement? Or are they so dependent upon the genetic material of this planet for their own survival that they are willing to continue along with the governments to perpetuate the policies of denial? Right now, it feels like that that latter is what is in effect. But... There have also been all kinds of noise that by 2016 to 2017, not very far away, but those are years that have been out there on uh, calendars in the human abduction syndrome for a very long time, that something will occur that will shift all of this into the light, and it may be something that none of us have even thought about. And I guess... 
for you, for me, for Steve, the citizen hearing, and for humanity. I hope it will be the whole truth and that our human family will be able to absorb the truth and our planet then go forward with a collaboration with other intelligences, even if they need genetic material from this planet, that we can do it in a straightforward, this is what it is, this is why, and it will be a two-way street, not a one-way street. Just a couple more questions, and then I want to ask you to give a final message to everybody out there. Uh, you came across a piece of metal that is, uh, or possible metal, that is consistent with anti-gravity. Can you briefly tell us about that real quick? Uh, nobody's ever established it as being uh, to do with anti-gravity. It is the bismuth magnesium zinc layered metal. Uh, it goes back to 1996. It, uh, it, there was a series of shipments to Art Bell, who was sending me samples of each shipment because I was working with Art weekly then on Dreamland and Coast to Coast AM. And I began with the first shipment was aluminum, the second shipment was something else and so forth. And third shipment was uh, bismuth, pure layers of bismuth, one to four uh, microns thick, alternating with 100 to 200 microns thick of nearly, um, it was 97.6% magnesium zinc. And uh, it was, it, the magnesium was the 97.6 part, the 2.4 part was the zinc. So it was like an alloy, alloy. And these alternated like a tort cake, about 32 layers at the nano level. And to cut through from 96 to 2014, I have worked with conservatively 20 different scientists labs. And today in 2014, even though we don't know what it was for, we don't know how it was made, no one has ever reproduced it. We just have the a letter that came with it allegedly from the grandson of a man who served security at a crash site of a wedge shape, not a round, not circle, wedge, wedge shaped like a pie, a vehicle from outer space classified as extraterrestrial. Uh, the grandfather was supposed to have been a security guard who watched the bottom of the wedge-shaped glow for three hours with a strange orange light and must have had a moment where the military left and he was part of the security team left and allegedly he pulled these pieces off the bottom after it cooled. Now, because we have never been able to determine function, how to make it, nobody's reproduced it, everybody says nobody puts bismuth and magnesium together. One of the most intriguing new theories that comes from the original letter sent to us in 1996 that said this was an extraterrestrial craft that encountered a thunderstorm or something in the atmosphere and that it was coming down and that it, the uh, intelligence on it had instructions or this was their automatic, uh, this was their automatic strategy to destroy the extraterrestrial technology. So now we've got material that may have had a function on a wedge-shaped craft in 47 that had a self-destruct energy mechanism applied to it uh, before we ever got to it. That's a new wrinkle in the difficulty of understanding what this bismuth zinc, uh, bismuth pure magnesium zinc alloy alternating in nanotechnology layers, what was it? What did it do? You know, 
with that piece of technology and like you said the actual physical cases of the cattle mutilation other animal mutilations being the hard evidence that we are using to get to our conclusions as well as our late Roger Dr. Roger Lear's implants I think we're all making progress versus what we had uh, over the past decades to getting closer to the truth and getting through this disinformation. Miss Howe, it has been truly an honor to interview you, and I wanted to ask you if there's any final words you want to give out to anybody out there who's listening and watching this. I was born and raised as an American when I thought this was a government of and by the, for the people, and it would be wonderful if we could be in a government that would say, you all deserve to know.